Hey, and welcome everybody to our 47th How to Repair Pendulum Clocks Open Clock Club. And um, ooh, I've just clicked a button I shouldn't have clicked. There was a little bit of anxiety uh, this evening because there was a slight risk that we were actually going to start early for once, but we seem to have avoided that with a bit of last minute procrastination. So um, uh, super special one. Welcome everybody, uh, particularly beginners. Uh, particularly anybody who bought our book this week, always very much appreciated. And please do remember that this series of events is recorded and it goes up on our YouTube channel uh, of the same name. So if you want to remain anonymous, then please keep your camera turned off. But otherwise, um, Welcome and uh, nice. One thing I've never really had time to notice before, but we seem to have had the luxury of about 30 seconds with nothing to do, was to look at people's backgrounds. So it's really nice to see everybody's backgrounds there. I can see books and clocks and Franklin with his nice, neat looking workshop. It's a good job you can't, can't see my workshop because it's not as neat as Franklin's by a long chalk. But anyway, um, we've, as always, we've got Team Open Clock Club here waiting in the wings uh, to engage you and hopefully for you to engage us with questions via the live chat function and also where you are, who you are and what you've been up to. And I think we've got some news as well this week um, because uh, last week or the week, yeah, the week before this one we've just had uh, we did a lot of stuff on uh, contract with the automaton, the Swan automaton, and there are a few videos that you might like to see. There are panel discussions and also a film. So I think Team Open Clock Club is going to put, yeah, I've done it, put it uh, the link in the description or in the live chat. So there you go. Okay, so um, we've got some noise coming from somewhere. That might be me. I've got no idea. So, so this last few weeks, we've been talking about common faults, and you will be delighted to know that we're getting towards the top of our list. We are now, in fact, up to or down to number three. Um, let me just, there we go, um, down to number three. And number three is uh, hands loose. You can see here before you, I've got a nice little range of uh, clock hands. So this came, this was basically what faults do we find typically uh, we get on the Facebook group. And again, thank you to all those who contribute to the Facebook group, really appreciated. Again, I don't know, maybe something to do with the Facebook algorithm but the membership for that group sort of goes in fits and starts. And this week has been super busy. We've been admitting about um, 20 people a day. And I've been out for the day and noticed there are a whole lot of people queuing up, which is absolutely brilliant. If you are a member of that group, as I said, thank you for contributing. But also, if you've got a clock on the bench, please, if you can, remember to take a few photographs and share work in progress because I think what sets that group um, uh, apart from maybe other Facebook groups, I don't know, is the fact that uh, it's that kind of really getting into the mechanism. And I know uh, Jonas, who I can see there, has been helping out with a few videos, which is also brilliant. So thank you. So clock hands. Now, I think uh, without getting straight onto my soapbox and banging on about things, I think clock hands are a particular problem because in some people's minds, uh, I don't know who those people are, of course, but um, we, we get, tend to get obsessed by the clock mechanism, the movement. Um, and when that's done, you've done the springs and any cleaning and maybe a bit of bushing and the escapement, that's kind of a lot of work in its own right. So the case and the uh, pendulum and the hands, sometimes in practice, tend to kind of get thrown on at the last minute. I've witnessed this, and I won't mention clock stands because I mention them too much every week, but the clock isn't done when the movement's done. That's the problem. There's like 50% of the energy is in all the other stuff. In fact, often it's more than 50% of the energy. So when your clock is ticking away on test and all is not finished. So clock hands, I mean, I've got a couple of different kinds here. And uh, it's, if we take the kind of um, 
earliest kind, we will go through some of the problems uh, that you're likely to encounter. So I'll just move these out of the way for the time being um, and start with this, which is a sing uh, hand from a single handed clock. And um, it's actually quite cool here because we can also see the friction work. So in the vast majority of clocks we're likely to find, and I think we talked about this last week, so I don't need to go over all ground, um, but you've got a mechanism, a gear train, the going train, typically that's the time uh, that runs. And then you've got the indicator, which is typically hands. It can be moon phase, it can be calendar work, whatever. Let's talk about hands. And between those two things, you need a clutch. So here you can see rather nicely that the clutch is this uh, spring, uh, often a spring like this. Uh, if we take it off, we can see it's just a piece of work, hardened brass, um, slightly irrelevant to the story. But when we look, we turn the hand, uh, we can see that the hand moves independently of the gear train. On the back are the 12 uh, ratch, as they're sometimes called, or the lifting pieces for the uh, striking work. So if you've not seen a uh, sort of 18th, 19th century European style, but I guess it's the same on American clocks as well, uh, 30 hour posted frame movement, then this is what it's like uh, on the back where you've only got a single hour hand. Now, without going off piece too much, these clocks were often uh, updated to double hand and the, uh, I'm sure Ian's got many, if Ian, is Ian with us this evening? Yeah. Yeah, Ian's there. I'm sure Ian has got examples of this in his vast collection of clocks, where you will notice that the chapter ring, the way you can broadly tell in clocks that have been updated to two hands from one, is that the chapter ring uh, doesn't have any minutes on it. It's typically only got hours, quarter, hour, half hour markers, and half quarter markers and things like that. Anyway, so there's... Um, just a little kind of clutch that you might not see. See, it's very simple. But what we're actually interested in here is the, uh, find my pointer stick. I've still got some Rodico on it from the other day. It's the, it's the hand. And let's just get a bit of focusing action going on there. There we go. And you can see here, it's really typical that this hand has been uh, punch marked around to try and spread the material. Now, the reality of that, of course, is we were talking the other day about something, I think it was a ratchet click, wasn't it, on our American clock on Thursday, that punching like that typically is an incredibly short-term uh, solution. The reason these things get punched is because uh, on these 18th and, well, earlier, but 18th and 19th century clocks, is you can see here that the square isn't a square, it's handmade. So before mass production, the square is handmade. So you make the square and you make the hand and you make them to fit together basically. So it doesn't matter that it's not a square, they just fit together in one position. And this is the point that they're often marked with a little file cut or something in the direction of the hand. But if you don't know that and you come along to repair the clock and you try and put it on like this, um, and you'll think, oh, why isn't it sitting down right? It's all wobbly like this. Or if you put it on like that, then it doesn't sit down at all. So you get a hammer or something and you try and shove it on and it makes the hole big. Uh, so that causes a lot of problems in future. So my first point with, um, I don't have a long case clock here, but they're basically the same. Um, whether or not it's a square hole here for the hour hand, Sometimes that's on uh, 17th century work, that's actually pentagonal or hexagonal or octagonal, like lots of clockmakers showing off skills, but they fit on in one direction. So it's worth um, sort of looking at those marks um, and they're often there to find out originally where the hand fitted. And it might be that you don't wanna put it back where it was originally because all sorts of alterations might have taken place but it will get you somewhere. Um, so there's another thing here that I don't have, I did, lost it. Um, the, oh, it's up here. Here we are. Here's a similar thing, slightly 
more advanced, but here's our trusty old long case clock, tall case clock from this, I don't know when that uh, 30 hour clock was made, but let's say it's 18th century. And this clock here, this long case clock is 19th century, but you can see a similar kind of idea. So what you've got here is the hour pipe. Um, if we can just move the dilapidated rack out of the way, which we can't because I'm just taking the pin out. You can see that the hour pipe um, has got a screw hole here to hold the hand on. Now that may be uh, originally like that, but often there's nothing there. You're just relying on two tapers fitting together. As we've talked about many times, 18th, 19th century clockwork, you get things to fit together by a kind of brooch taper, so a very low taper. Um, and the problem with these is a bit like the 30 hour hand we just seen, is that every time the hand is pushed on here, a little bit of metal or dirt builds up in the bottom of this uh, kind of corner here. In fact, let me just have a look at that. Yeah, okay. So I'm gonna draw this because this is really, uh, well, I think it's really I don't know if it's important, but it's certainly incredibly useful. So, and was left without his top on. So, here's our, um, our pipe like this. And you can see that zoom out a little bit. There we go. So put my pen back in its holder. So um, when, oops, when you, the hour pipe uh, is tapered here, and at the base of the pipe, there is a cutaway, and you'll often find this with turn components where you want two things to fit together. Anybody out there who's a machinist or operates on a lathe, um, what you don't want is a right angle corner like that for a right angle thing to fit into it like that, because they might fit together the very first day they're made but after that they won't fit together because you will get a bit of dirt or something that builds up in there um if you look at your lathe bed like a, a, a center lathe where the cross slide fits on or something the edge will always be beveled or cut away underneath because what happens here over time is that either dirt or bits of metal get built up so they get pushed down here and built up and built up until eventually this little cutaway bit which i've drawn quite exaggerated gets full of dirt and then inevitably when you come to struggling today with my pen stand when you come to put the hand on like this what used to fit um nice and tight here and sit down against this edge no longer sits on the edge and it's wobbling around. So what people do, and I totally understand this, is rather than kind of knowing about this little cutaway bit, because it's, I've drawn it quite exaggerated, but it's actually quite subtle on this hour pipe, is that they think that out the hand has come loose and it hasn't, it's just not sitting down properly. So they start to hammer it or center punch it, which thins out the metal or distorts the metal and it never, ever fits on again properly. So if you're dealing with um, either clocks like this with a little square or particularly with instances like this, and I don't think you can probably see, or you maybe can actually uh, focus again. Here, this part of the pipe, if I get my pointy stick, that part there is flat. And that's the flat against which the hand sits. And then there's a little bit of a graver. So somebody just got a graver when they're making this and just cut in to the corner to make it sit down. And it's that area there that gets full of dirt and bits of metal that are pushed down. So really important to clean that out. And also I noticed on this hand here, this uh, single hand, so it's beautiful iron hand, really nice. But because it's become um, dished underneath, somebody has hammered it on, sorry, hammered it on top. Uh, 
with a kind of curved hammer like this to try and spread the metal. Like that. What's happened is it curves underneath, so it never sits flat. So it's always wobbling around. So that is your problem, basically. And why it's really, again, cool to make, if you can, new work, and if you've got the luxury of having a lathe, make things that fit together. And so you'll really get used to this idea of uh, undercutting components. Uh, another great example of it is here um, on the pillars of this clock. Uh, if we were to take this plate off here, we'd notice that the pillar was uh, undercut. So the plate only touches at the edges. It doesn't touch the whole way across because again, the plate would never sit down nice and flat. So look out for those undercuts. Now, what you do about this is a completely, and uh, we've actually talked about this before, and this metal here gets so messed up, like this one has gotten so punched and distorted. The first thing I'd do here, if this were a clock, a hand for that long case clock, is I would flatten this. So I would put it on um, a steel stake. Yeah, I would clean it with some four knot steel wool. So I would I would clean up all the dirt first with a Glasgow brush and yeah, some solvent. It could be isopropyl alcohol, could be uh, your paraffin. Uh, just something that's going to get that dirt moving. You could even just use uh, water. You could use um, uh, whatever they call it now, not distilled water. I forgot the name of it. Um, it'll come to me. Deionized water, uh, which is a really good solvent. And um, just to get the dirt off. And then you've got to look at that joint and see whether the metal has been pushed down. Because what happens is the minute you start center punching this, you've not got that large bearing surface. You've got a curved surface with a, like a bit sticking out. And that bit sticking out scrapes metal down and it just makes the whole situation worse. So every time you take the hand off, put it back on again, it gets more and more and more wobbly. And a bit like we did with, um, where has it gone? I've lost it again. With a, a winding square, you know, where we tapped the material back down. What you could do with, I will get that hour pipe off actually. So I've got my um, push bike in the way as well. It's making life even more challenging. This is good. Wouldn't have it any other way. Um, it's winter now, so the bike can't live outside anymore. It's had to come inside and snuggle up to the radiator. I'm sure I'm not the only one with uh, bicycles inside, motorbikes in bits, anybody? Car engine in bits in the front room? I'm sure there's somebody with that uh, situation. So with this, uh, which you will come across, is the metal gets pushed down because the hand is a very good fit. The minute somebody sends a punch, it or hammers it with a punch, kind of had it. So what you'd want to do is to tap that material back down again, but obviously you can't do it when it's unsupported. So you'd have to get a bit of brass and either file it or turn it. Again, this is tapered inside here. So it's a really good fit because you can see that edge there is only about half a mil. So if you start hammering it to push the metal back, it's just going to collapse in on itself. So I would get a polish. I would fill this hole with a bit of brass really tight and then get a polished punch and begin gently kind of working that material back into the surface. Um, but it doesn't help you much with the, uh, with the hand because the material here has gotten thinned. And I think um, what I've seen with this, and I think it's probably the only way to go. I mean, there are many ways. Again, we've been talking increasingly um, about laser welding. If you've got somebody who can do laser welding or you've got access to that, you could weld on more material and then cut that back, which would give you sort of build up some material there. And what I've seen done quite successfully, once this has been flattened the other way, is to actually make a piece of brass that goes in here. So to um, open it, open the hole more and rivet in a piece of brass or even solid, rivet it solid with a plug and then begin to open up again. Obviously it's a bit like bushing when you make that decision, 
you have to think of this cost benefit thing of the um, I'm going to actually remove material to add material, but on the benefit side, I'm going to make the thing much more stable and stop the hand from wobbling about. Because of course, if the hand wobbles about, not only is it likely to loop, work loose and stop the clock, and I'm sure we've all had that, but slightly worse than that, it's maybe going to even touch the dial. And we've all seen dials where the hand has been touching the dial and it goes round and round and round and it scratches it. Um, I mean, on 18th and 19th century clocks, again, you get a lot of things to do with dial feet, where the dial feet, the clock's either been dropped or something has been changed and the front plate of the movement and the dial are no longer parallel. So uh, as the hand rotates, it's closer to the dial in one place than the other. On our old live stream clock, we had something that had been broken off and et cetera. So really important to stand back. And I, I suppose in kind of conclusion on that, at least, what I would say is really important to remember, particularly when you're in practice and you're working on uh, clocks for clients, that the job isn't done until the job is done. Uh, you know, don't leave it to the last minute to be doing um, the hands. Just thought it'd be cool to look at these hand collets. I'm sure everybody's got a box of something like this with a load of hand collets in, which are quite useful. Um, I would, again, if you've got a lathe, it's probably, frankly, easier to make them new. Um, it's just, then at least you can make them to fit and everything. But we don't all have that luxury. So inevitably we build up a box like this. Um, how's the questions? Good, yeah. No questions for me. No. Good. That's perfect. The right best kind of questions. So talk about why your bike is in the workshop. Oh, Ian says good bikes have to be inside. Good bikes have to be inside. And the reason my bike's in the workshop is because uh in another life where I wasn't a clockmaker and I was a retailer and actually had money, I got a bike and it had loads of nice chrome plating on it. And the chrome plating looks amazing but it sees water and everything starts going rusty. Plus I did cloth handlebar tape with, um, with shellac on it. And again, it just can't go outside basically. It's just an indoor bike now, but not like one of those Peloton bikes. Um, so I need another bike, I need a winter bike basically. And also I need new grips. What grips do I need, Frankie? Death grips. I need death grips. We went to a bike show today and there are these like mountain bike grips and they're really cool. They're called death grips anyway. So I might get those. But anyway, Is not that just like death. Yeah. Death DGM or something. I don't know what they are. Uh, anyway. DMR, yeah. DMR death grips. DMR. So hand collets, you will often find if you buy, I guess you can buy a selection from a, your cousins or Walsh or Time Service of the Collet in the States. And they're often little punched out bits of metal like this. And they're actually quite good. Your problem is the hole in the middle is often not the right size. They're quite good because at least they only touch on the outside. Um, what you have to be, if I can find one, aware of. Yeah, and these are some old fashioned ones here. These are quite cool too. And as you can see, but it's dished on the inside. Really important that it fits like that. I don't know if I can find a solid one. Um, oh, this is a real blast from the past. Here we are, look when you could buy long case clock hand collets like that, which are really nice. So again, just going back to our cutaway uh, thing, let's move across here, uh, splash out a new bit of paper. So um, here's your hand like this. Um, let's see the drawing, there we go. Here's our hand, terrible drawing, but anyway, in section. And here's our center, like that little pinhole through it. Um, really important that the collet sits, as you've just seen there, kind of like that. If it's flat on the back, it'll wobble. And I think some of them that I've seen are new ones, you know, if you just part a piece off a bit of brass bar, then they're solid on the back and it doesn't work properly. So if you're making them new, um, what you kind of have to do is to turn away a bit like that. Uh, 
uh, at the back. So you've got this space here and then it'll sit at the outside edges and push the hand down. As we said many times, really important that the collet fits right up to the pin. In fact, I think those, um, I've got rid of them now. Um, I've got this extra little bit here, which is useful that you can just file it down and file it down until you get it to the correct height. Because if you've got the arrangement we've just seen or the arrangement like we've seen many times on a long case clock where you've got a friction spring, it's really important that that spring is compressed because A, that's the clutch, but also the pin needs to be in the hole, otherwise the whole thing will fall apart. Okay. Um, let's have a look at something a bit more modern. So here is a French clock. Uh, I think the biggest problem I find, French clocks are really beautifully made. So um, I can't get the uh, thing off. Well, to deal with it on the clock itself. So here, you haven't got a sheet metal hand that fits straight onto the uh, the pipe, the hour pipe in this case. What you've got is um, an hour pipe, and I don't know if you can see. If we get it sideways, maybe you can. Very cleverly, really cleverly, the hour pipe is actually turned away. If you've ever worked on a watch uh, with a cannon pinion. And when you push the cannon pinion on the center arbor, there's a thing called a back slope. So when you set the hands of the watch, that stops the uh, hands falling off, basically. And you've got a similar thing here. So you've got a very subtle kind of uh, back slope. So it's smaller diameter here than it is here. So they use that in conjunction with a flexible collet. So the collet is thin enough to be very slightly flexible. And you can see they've sawn along. Now, if I were making this new, or if we were making it new, you might want to make it such a good fit and so thin that you don't actually need to saw down it like this. Probably better to saw it, not like this opposite, but in three. So one slot is never opposite another slot. But this is really nice because they've done such a beautiful job of turning this down to fit. Now, when you put the hour hand on, you have to ring it on. So you push and turn and it gets to that point. And then you push it on a little bit more and it kind of almost clicks in place. It's really beautiful. And because of the back slope, um, the, when you turn the hour hand, let's say you want to change, you, you push the hour hand on and it's not synchronized with the striking on that striking. It doesn't matter how many times you turn the hand round, and I'm being a bit brutal here, it doesn't work its way off. So super clever. Unlike this more modern version on a Smith Senfield mantle clock, um, when you turn the hand, you can notice that the hand slowly either works its way on, or in this curse case, it works its way off. So those 19th century French clocks have got an enormous amount to tell us in terms of quality. Now, they have some commonality, if that is actually such a word, and that is that in, let's get three hands together. We've got three hour hands here. We've got a modern quartz hand or a, a hand like you'd find on a 20th century uh, clock. And we've got a French clock hand and we've got a hand off an Enfield. And they've got the thing in common that they're riveted to a brass collet. So here's the thing, for whatever reason over time, particularly on this kind of hand and on the end fields, that collet gets worn or it gets stretched a little bit or the pipe gets worn or something happens and it's no longer a good fit. And I, in my experience, and I'm sure you've all got your way of working with this, what doesn't work is to get a pair of pliers and just squeeze it. So, um, Happy. Is, there, is there a little bit of the collet that has a groove across it for a pin? There are long case clock hands, if, if I've got it right. Like, imagine this is an hour hand on a long case clock. There are sometimes uh, slip washers, in fact, very much like um, this exactly like that in fact, but that hold the hand on. There are sometimes two little holes drilled through the corner of the square. 
and you put very fine taper pins in there. And sometimes, as we've already seen with the long case clock, there's one, or if you're working on something that's better quality, uh, there are two screws that hold the thing on. And they're kind of all fine because those solutions are pretty easy to keep the hand held on. Held on. The problematic one is the one where the hand just shoves on to the, uh, to the square or round in this case, and there's nothing else holding it there other than uh, friction, if that answers the problem. So yeah, there's a whole variety of ways that these hands are held on. This one's got, because um, it's a single hand, it's got a pin through, so it's not a problem. It's the ones where they just get pushed on that often give us, uh, give us a problem. Did that answer the question? Yeah. Ian's got a really nice picture already on the Facebook group of a single hand. Right, uh, okay. About 1720. Nice. Has Ian got a clock that's been converted for single hand to two hands? That would be cool to see as well. So temporarily back to our um, hand collet thing here. What do you do if that collet has gotten stretched or something? And what doesn't work in the long term is to get a pair of pliers. I won't do it on my French clock hand, but I'll do it on this old quartz hand and try and squeeze it across like that or and go around like this. I mean, it might work a little bit, but all you tend to do is to get a tight bit and then the other bit where you're not squeezing becomes even sloppier. So the hand is now tight in one plane, but in the other plane, it's a lot sloppier. It just really doesn't work. And I found the best way with this, and this isn't gonna be particularly helpful, I'm afraid, but if you've got a collet lathe, and watch people, you have to put fingers in your ears. Um, that guy from, I don't know, I've forgotten what it's called now. Well, I haven't, but I won't mention it. Who said that Matthew Reed should never, ever be allowed lay near a lathe, which is true. Um, basically, if you've got something like a bigger collet lathe, uh, then like a watchmaker's lathe, but bigger, find a well-fitting collet and actually just very gently squeeze this hand collet smaller. That's the most successful way that I've ever found of doing it. Um, but obviously we don't have that option. So uh, here's another option, something like a draw plate. So normally uh, you use it and you draw wire through this thing, but it also happens to very conveniently have a whole load of tapered holes in it. So um, you could broach a hole in a bit of metal or something, but basically with this, you can find, I think these are maybe all the same size. Oh, well, there's one that it fits into. So you can find um, uh, a hole that the back of the collet fits into, and then using a rawhide mallet or something, you can encourage that in. And at least it'll squeeze it the whole way around. Um, I think what you'll find is anything that involves squeezing it with pliers or um, a center punch in it or something, is basically never going to work in the longer term. It might get the clock out of the door, but in a few months, your client will ring up and say that the clock stopped because the hands are touching or something. So I think that's quite uh, problematic. Another problem with colleted hands like this quartz one is that it's very, very, very tempting. Let's go back to our Enfield. Here's our Enfield clock. OK, so problems with hands. Here's your problem. When you want to clean the clock, some people might argue that you can only properly clean the clock if you get it completely apart. And that involves getting off this, um, in this case, uh, pinion and combined lifting piece. Now, the problem with getting it off, what getting it off is one thing. It's described in that amazing book called How to Repair Pendulum Clocks, Making a Little Tool. Getting it on is also a challenge, but it can be done. But getting it on in the right place is a, another thing altogether. And of course, so it's tempting as it is. Uh, and I think, Frankie, you've had this trauma, haven't you? You put this thing on, and when you fit the hands together and the clock together, it doesn't strike at the right time. And it's very, 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 very tempting to get something like the back end of a file or a brooch, in this case, it just happens to be hanging around, put that on there, and then try and move the hand in relation to the collet. I'd have to trap it in the vice, and I could probably do it here, and I'm sure we've all done it, but again, it's never actually massively satisfying because the collet tends to work loose, and particularly, I don't know whether those, um, you guys will know, and I should know, whether the Hermela type clocks 
have got aluminium hands. Um, maybe they do, I don't know, but if they do like these quartz hands here, of course, as soon as you start to turn that collet within the hand, then either the hand gets bent or um, the aluminium just gets kind of squidged up and it becomes loose and then you start hitting it and then the whole thing uh, becomes more difficult. Matthew, when you were talking about lathe, Sturrock said he uses a three jaw chuck. To squeeze it down. Yeah, and Andrew um, said a pin vice, assuming you can get one big enough. Right, okay, yeah, that's a good, good idea. Or you could actually get some of those um, brass line pliers they're relatively inexpensive ones and kind of make a circle, file a circle away so you can squeeze it round. I'm sure there are ways of doing it, but just squeezing it with a pair of flat pliers or even getting your um, end cutters on, which is very tempting like this and going like this is, is not going to be satisfactory in anything other than the short term. In my experience, anyway, the hands always work loose. And as we've talked about things that work loose, that are on squares or well fitting like gathering pallets and i can't remember reminded here look here's my wobbly gathering pallet they're not self-healing it will only get worse and if you think and i've said this many times and you're probably sick of me saying it but if you're thinking mm, i might get away with that in my experience it's maybe just because i've been a bad person in the previous life and in this life those things always get worse and they fall off and they cause you more trouble and so you think I should have done it right in the first place. So, yeah, hands are problematic. And I suppose the, um, uh, the resounding um, message here is the clock is not fixed when the movement is ticking and it's ticking away on your lovely test stand. You can see Jonas there and his super high end, uh, all, all encompassing test stand, which is really cool but the clock is not done oh there it's in the shot way wow look at that animal great thank you for showing us that um anyway the clock isn't done when it's on the test stand uh, i think is my message I said that too many times okay we can come back to hands uh i've lost my list now of faults what's next on the list of faults so let's cross hands off Yay, getting through them slowly. Number two, da, 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 da. lost it. I think it's clean. Where's it gone? 18, 19, 20. Oh, it's that. Okay, so fault. This isn't really a fault per se, but we do see it a lot. I cleaned that clock. And you know that I've got a pretty controversial um, approach to cleaning clocks. A lot of people don't even call what I. Uh, the washing that I do cleaning. But anyway, let's not get into that just this moment. But number two on the top 24 things that go wrong with clocks is not getting the oil sinks and the bearing holes clean. So I know there are beginners out there. So let's just run through it. Those people who have listened to this for 47 weeks now might want to go off and make a cup of tea because you've heard it all before. In fact, the joy is we were just talking before we went live on air of the uh, sort of communal responsibility. Of course, the joy is that you can now all say whatever Matthew says, some of it's good, some of it's bad, some of it's terrible, whatever. Um, but you can go out into the world and spread the joy. So cleaning. So let's just go right back to the beginning without going over everything. What on earth is cleaning? Well, if you ask Open Team Open Clock Club what is dirt, you'll get like an answer that takes 43 years to get through and several PhD papers. So um, I think the problem with dirt and yeah, what, what are you doing when you clean? Well, that's a nice little philosophical um, uh, dinner party kind of conversation. So if friends are inviting you out over the weekend or something like, when they start wanting to talk about football or motor racing or whatever it is people talk about, you can say, oh, yeah, but guys, let's really just talk about what is dirt. And um, there you go. You'll never get invited out again. So what is dirt? What we, why are we trying to clean a clock, I suppose, is the answer. Well, I'm trying to clean a clock or wash dirt away primarily, but not exclusively because uh, most clocks like this and like that and like that, in fact, everything in this room, I think, um, when the clock is made and it's new, 
uh, the bearings are oiled, which is number one on the list. So oiling and cleaning obviously go together. And what happens is, unlike watches that tend to be in pretty uh, hermetically sealed cases, but again, not exclusively, clocks are not. You know, the, the case of a clock is rarely, if ever, a dust tight device. Uh, in fact, most of them have actually got great big holes in that you can see daylight through. So that oil, not only does it become contaminated uh, with airborne dust, and it's primarily the inorganic dust that we're interested in, it's not, although the stuff that comes off us, human beings, hair, skin, pets, the pets have hair and stuff? Yes. Yeah, pets have got hair, it's been confirmed. All that gets on the oil, but that's not a massive problem because that organic stuff tends to be quite soft. It might eventually stop the clock and just turn into a gloop, but that's fine. The problem is the inorganic material. So things like mica, quartz, stuff from stone, concrete, gravel, you name it, it's floating about in the air and it gets in the oil and it's this classic kind of grinding paste uh, scenario ensues, which is my primary reason for wanting to wash that away, which is why I'm not particularly interested in cleaning the frame per se. It's to get rid of old oil so we can put fresh oil in and uh, the bearing is running without this grinding thing going on. Okay, so having established that, for me, anyway, what I do in my mind is to differentiate between um, working surfaces, oh, so-called working surfaces and so-called non-working surfaces. So if we take our trusty early 19th century tall case clock movement again, which is getting more and more and more dilapidated as the weeks go by, keep taking parts off but let's just have a quick run round now i'm not going to talk about cleaning the non-working surfaces because that's a, a total uh, nightmare in its own right but here of course we've got places like where that pin there lifts uh, the lifting piece that's a working surface is a bearing surface you've got the piece where the warning piece lifts the rack hook that's a working surface You've got the bit where the gathering pallet gathers the teeth and locks uh, and so on and so forth. So they, for me, are one uh, part of the mechanism that's very distinct from this bit, the frame or the back of the dial or this bit or that bit or that bit. And yeah, I don't want kind of three dimensional spiders webs and pet hair on it. Um, but I'm also not fussed about refinishing it because all that does, in my view, is it holds those bearing surfaces in place. It's like the chassis of a car, if you like, although car analogies are often really dangerous. You know, the chassis doesn't do anything. Um, I know it does, but it kind of holds all the useful bits in place. So that's how I see a, a clock working and non-working surfaces. And although these things here are all important surfaces, the thing that really gets people, and I totally get why, are the bearing holes, the train wheel bearing holes. So for uh, this um, two train Enfield, for instance, we've got two trains, uh, that's two gear boxes, two uh, independent, we've got a set of gears that go with the going train, the hands, and we've got a set of gears that go with the striking train. In many clocks, you've got three, you've got a chiming, a striking, and a going. In some clocks, you've got four, you've got an alarm as well, and so on and so forth. But it's where the bearings, the axles, like this one here, run in the bearing holes that I'm interested in. So let's just have a little drawing of that. And I know most of you are totally familiar with this. Um, how are we doing something 44? Okay. So let's just have a quick look without laboring it too much. My yellow pen's on its last leg, so we're gonna have to be a bit creative with our color coding. So here's our frame. Okay, typical uh, clock frame. So this is the section. So it's as if we've sawn through uh, a clock plate. This is our plate. And in the plate, we've got a lovely I won't use that colour, I'll use red instead. Uh, we've got a lovely little uh, axle rotating. Let's just draw that, something like that. Come out, got a shoulder on it, and so on. Okay, so despite the rather random colour coding here, 
um, let's find the old sign. We've got, a, in most cases, you've got a steel axle. So this is steel, bad color coding, sorry, running in a brass frame, bad color coding again. Okay, so this rotates within this. This, this is called a bearing, probably the simplest kind of bearing you can get because there are no other rotating elements like in a machine bearing or something. And like most bearings, the vast majority we see in horology, unless you're working on Harrison clocks with lignum vitae, is you need added lubrication. Okay, with the reason we use brass and steel together is because in relative terms, brass and steel have got a low coefficient of friction, but they still need added lubrication. So that's the oiling part. And when we oil a bearing like this, I'll draw a little meniscus here, we get oil in between here, like this, like that. And there's a little meniscus around there. And that there's no, uh, unlike a car engine, there's no labyrinth seal, there's no neoprene seals. It's just open to the air. So this oil gets contaminated and it spreads and it goes thick and it turns acid. So we want to wash that away. Now, a bit like the Bashi said before about getting rid of the dirt on the owl wheel pipe, primarily, but not exclusively, you've got to take the clock apart. Now, um, I think uh, my controversial um, mainspring video, and it was really, I won't delay us now because we we're going to run out of time, but I had a really cool conversation with a, a, a watchmaker in the Swan Week, and he talked about leaving mainsprings in barrels for different reasons. But anyway, so you've got to take the clock apart. But again, remember, for beginners like this, you might actually want to leave uh that bearing in place because it's quite tricky but basically we take the clock apart and you've got two components and you're using a solvent whether that's a water-based thing which i personally don't like i prefer uh, like with like so you've got oil which tends to come from digging it up out of the earth but it can come from uh animals or it can come from plants uh, or it can be synthesized um but a good way to get rid of oil is to wash, and I mean wash like with a brush, like you would scrub your teeth, basically. The, although of course toothpaste is an abrasive as well, bad analogy, um, wash something else, wash the dishes. Uh, you would use uh, a solvent, maybe uh, with dishes you use water and you use a surfactant surface active ingredient, like washing up liquid. And that gets rid of the majority of the mess, just washing, uh, is for as far as I'm concerned and brushing with a natural natural bristle brush is enough other than you can't really wash properly thoroughly inside the hole so traditionally um, here's our um, plate our clock plate and let's just zoom in if we can um, we've got a whole lot of holes most of these holes are bearing holes in fact they're probably all are apart from this one and this one, which are the pillar holes. So we get a bit of wood. This is a bit of beech wood. But again, if we go back to the peg wood tray thing, um, you can buy commercially peg wood like that. Some people peg wood like that. Some people use uh, bamboo skewers. I'm not against those. I don't particularly like the way that it works. But um, if you've got a garden, you can get uh, this stuff, which is dogwood, which we got from our, well, not from our garden, stole it from somebody else's garden, of course. Uh, and this is the stuff that see the bright yellow or bright red stems, uh, dogwood corners, I think they call it. That, dry that out. Here's another big, I got dogwood. Um, what else have we got in here? Uh, the beach, which are skewers for meat and so on. But anyway, basically you get the message. You want a bit of wood that you can, jam in the hole and that cleans the hole out so if you read any book like the carl or you name it they say get the wood let's just sharpen it uh with a knife um blunt knife bad knife try another one another blunt knife a very hard wood and then you basically shove the pegwood into the hole like this wrong size like this and you do this and it comes out and it's got old oil on it. So you scrape it away again and do it again. Personally, I find this is much more effective in 
uh, whatever solvent you're using because you've got that kind of double action thing. And for sharpening the wood, which you can see I've done spectacularly poorly, I actually prefer to use a really coarse new file. I find that much more effective and it kind of um, tears up the surface of the wood, which, which seems to make it nice and grippy. Uh, is that say 50? Sorry, I can never see the clock. Yeah. Right, okay. So um, I think a very coarse new file is actually as good as or better than a knife, but there we go. So in the hole, both sides, and you keep sharpening the wood until the wood comes out clean. So whatever book you read, most of them will tell you to do that. And I've got no problem with that, absolutely uh, fine. For the oil sink side, um, is what I would do is just to cut a bit of a, two flats on the wood, that's better, and turn it into a shape pretty much of a screwdriver. And this probably seems like the most sort of logical thing in the world. So you've got a shape there, like a screwdriver blade, then get your file and turn that screwdriver into the shape of a drill like that. So you've got a point, but you've got two angles on it and pretty obviously those angles fit in your, um, in your oil sink and that cleans out the oil sink and you continue to do that until the wood comes out clean. Then uh, according to the books, the, the bearing hole is cleaned, which is great. And I have no problem with that at all. Um, and the good thing for me about that is it doesn't affect the plate around it much. It just cleans up the bearing hole. Uh, Jim says, what about very small pivot balls like in a French clock? Yeah, same thing with the pegwood. Just use small pegwood. There is a um, top tip with French clocks, which will stop you from driving yourself absolutely bonkers. Two top tips is that with these uh, small pivot holes up here, exactly the same pegwood, but just use finer pegwood. But I found, I think, uh, what is like the best thing ever, um, because what happens is, you start with a pegwood, it's been in the drawer, it's dry. I always peg out in the actual solution. So the pegwood goes into the hole, it starts soaking up the um, fluid, and then it expands and breaks off in the hole. And it's really, really, really difficult to get the pegwood out of those 0.6 millimeter, 0.5 millimeter holes. So two things there, two top tips. One, uh, to prevent that from happening, soak the wood in the solvent for a few minutes before you actually start jamming it in the hole. And it makes the fibers of the wood open up and prevent it from breaking off. But secondly, inevitably, um, I was talking to my co-author John the other day about this, when pegwood breaks off in the fly pivot of a French clock, which it will, it is like really difficult to get it out, but I've uh, learned how to do it. And that is get a soldering iron, you know, electrical, not a gas thing, but a regular electrician soldering iron, and just put that on the uh, end of the pegwood or on the hole, and it dehydrates the wood. And after about a minute, the wood almost becomes charred and you can just push it out. Well, you'd have to drill it out or anything like that. So yeah, pegwood all round. And this is where we're going, like the most radical mind bending thing I've ever said on this uh, series of events is that, Sometimes, and um, this is uh, heretical, I know, but sometimes, even for me, um, who doesn't really like cleaning anything, that pegwood isn't enough. It just doesn't deal with the varnish type device that you seem to get in some oil sinks. And secondly, on the inside of the plate, and of course I don't have a really good example, but round here, what you tend to get on the inside shoulder is a lot of kind of impacted oil. And although the arbors don't bang up and down as they're being rotated, for some reason, the oil on the inside seems particularly difficult to get rid of. So sometimes what I do, where I've got that varnish type um, thing going on in the oil sink, is I'll use a bit of four knot steel wool in the hole. So I've got my steel wool here teeny weeny bit is all you need. And if I'm not happy with it, I'll actually use, if you can see that tiny little bit of steel wool in the hole like that. 
And of course, the steel wool cuts incredibly quickly. So you have to be, um, uh, you have to use this very sparingly. Don't go bonkers with it because you'll end up with a bigger a hole. I always do this when I'm deburring new holes that have been bushed. If you ever do any bushing, it's really cool on the inside. But I find more importantly, uh, without touching the plate, of course, and this is a tricky bit, so you've kind of got to get your um, peg with the right size, is to uh, get the um, refinish the oil sink and without touching the plate. And that kind of goes against a lot of the stuff that I've said, uh, but it's cost-benefit cost exercise. I would rather have the oil sink a bit refinished and a bit shinier than have the remnants of oil in there. And it may be the oil sink isn't a bearing surface. So I'm sounding completely hypocritical, but that is one of those things that kind of makes me think I've done a good job, not that there's any such thing as a good job or a bad job. So yeah, pegging out holes, that really satisfies number two on our list of 24 top uh, things, uh, pegging out the bearing surfaces and then just wash the stuff around it because the chassis of the clock, the non-working surfaces, for me, don't, they need washing, but they certainly don't need refinishing. Uh, um, Jonas and Derek both use toothpicks for pegwood. Right, okay, yeah, um, yeah. Um, David says, why is it screwed around the shape on one side? Um, because I'm a Yorkshireman, uh, Debashi, so I like to get value for money out of everything and save time because time is money. So when I'm pegging out and stuff, I move from one end, which has got the pointy bit for the pivot hole, and spin it round for the uh, oil sinks. So I, I always, one end as a point, one end as the oil sink cleaning device. And Wolfie says if you go over the top with a steel wool, you suddenly have to bush where you didn't need to before. You've got to bush, then you've got to polish the plate, refinish it. And somebody, I don't know, it was said on Facebook and it was really sweet. They said, yeah, then you think, I've, I've got to repaint this room. The room's looking terrible. The clock's all shiny. Then you've got to reconcrete the drive, buying your car, getting your life, and everything just totally goes down the pan. So um, that's my disaster <laughs> situation. But Wolf is absolutely, absolutely right. And a lot of people really hate that steel wool thing. What I would say about it is that, of course, if you do that, um, particularly with new bushes, you've got obviously got to clean out the hole afterwards. You don't just like throw the clock together with the little fibers of steel wool in there, you peg it all out. And I've done that for years and always found it okay. But that brings us neatly on with zero minutes to go to talk about the most controversial subject on the face of the planet apart from cleaning, which is, of course is oiling. And so we're gonna tackle that first thing next week. And what I would say is with oiling, it's much, much better. Don't obsess about the kind of oil, but the so-called right amount of oil, which nobody knows what that is anyway. And clean oil is better than the wrong type of oil if there's a kind of hierarchy. But before we go, I've got a thing to show you here, which is really cool and quite macabre. And that is, this um, is how uh, I know, uh, Chris and all those tool collectors, um, Ian will have all their oil delivered to them like this. And what this is, is a chronometer oil. Um, this is totally irrelevant by the way. So if you've got something better to do, then being great senior, we'll see you next week. Um, but I'll just use at the last minute talking about this oil when I was finding it. Don't use this, of course, this is a bit of a joke, but it's quite nice to see. So this is what oil used to be like. It's by Mobius. And uh, it's not going to come out of the thing because the box broken off now. Oh, there we are. Um, it's a little vial, presumably never being used, of oil for chronometers by Mobius. And it's whale from a whale, sperm whale oil, um, so which is incredibly waxy and presumably made incredibly good oil. But you can see here that the fat has separated out from the liquid um uh, liquid of the oil so i thought you might like to see that so we'll start next week and it'll probably take the whole uh, session um because it's uh, super controversial so bring along your clock oil week next week and uh, let's like bring your pet to work week but bring your clock oil to open clock club and we will talk about uh whether you use synthetic oil 
whether you use mineral, natural, I haven't got any natural, but I'll try to get some, whether you use natural or whatever. Um, it, uh, that's number one on the list of faults. And I kind of agree, it's the enemy of good, uh, whatever that is, as Abraham Louis Breguet said. In fact, for next week, uh, we need to find that quote, don't we, in French. Yeah. Uh, we've got um, some French speakers out there. Devashish, yes. Canadian? Yeah. yeah. Okay, we've got some French speakers. So French speakers, you've got homework. We need you to find the quote by Abraham Louis Breguet about give me the perfect oil and I'll give you the perfect watch and you can then present it in French. Okay, so thank you very much. We're out of time. Uh, uh, thank you for the Facebook thing. Have a look at those videos if you want to get involved in some slightly navel gazing type conversations about automata. And if we don't see you on the Facebook group or on Thursday at the live stream where we're working on uh, our American clock, then we'll hopefully see you uh, back here next week for our 48th, not quite our penultimate, but 48th Open Clock Club. So thanks to Team Open Clock Club and thank you. We'll see you next week. Bye for now.